Hello, I'm Andrew Suskind, and I'm a psychotherapist and author based in West Los Angeles since 1992, specializing in trauma and addictions. Welcome to our podcast, which I call It's Not About the Sex, also the title of my recent book. Here we focus on all topics related to compulsive sexual behavior, often referred to as sex addiction. In particular, we explore ways to build long-term, sustainable recovery while establishing more meaningful connection and greater intimacy. Our intention is to offer fresh viewpoints, brand new perspectives, and practical user-friendly tools toward living a more deeply connected life. Let's get started. So welcome, Eddie. I'm I'm so pleased that you could be here with us today. And and we have this experience of of talking from coast to coast, which is always a pleasure. Uh, You're in Marietta, Georgia. Is that right? That's right, Andrew. That's exactly right. I'm in Marietta, Georgia. I'm not a Southern boy, though. I'm a Jersey boy, but I moved down here about 18 years ago. Uh Uh-oh. We might need to get started on what part of Jersey because I'm exit four. Oh, okay. Wow, you're way down there. I'll make it one. Let's see. I go by. I don't go by the turnpike. I go by the parkway. So I'll make it one forty eight, up up that way toward Bloomfield. Okay, very good. Right, yeah. different parts of the state, but we're still yes. New Jersey New brethren. Jersey. So <laughs> very good. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you just to get started is if you could just share with our listening audience, a little bit about how you developed what you call the inner child recovery process and and how it originated. How did it get going originally for you? Yeah, Well, it, it originated really about nine years ago. And how it really came to be was in my practice in working with men, what I came to understand were there were nine different um, reasons for why men abuse sex. And with those nine reasons, I was able to then take that later on and turn it into something that was a little bit more uh, creative, but also allowing men to have the opportunity to learn how to nurture. Mm. Because I found that many men who, and I'm sure you've seen this in your practice also, who deal with a sex addiction or pornography addiction, they don't have the strongest emotional IQ. Mm. And so therefore they struggle in relationships. Mm -hmm. And therefore when part of the reason is because no one was really there as a, those early uh, childhood development years to nurture them in a proper way, to show them how to deal with emotional distress. So having the inner child sort of externalizing the addiction, the addict, I now gave them a place where they could go to learn how to nurture the pain that they themselves were feeling. Mm, Wonderful. And I love the idea, by the way, because I think the inner child speaks very much to the blueprint of childhood and how it influences our lives today. And, And it's something that has been very meaningful to me personally and professionally for many years. So I love that you're applying this to sex addiction and porn addiction. If I can ask you also, um, was there a reason why you chose this specialty area? And and what was the background that got you to this point? Mm. Well, I am a recovering sex addict myself. Uh, My history is a lot of womenizing. And I went through, I actually blew through two marriages because of it. Mm. Um, now I've been married to the same woman for 23 years. We've been together for 25. And I'm very happy to say I've been faithful the whole time. Mm. Shouldn't have to brag about that. I mean, <laughs> that should be to give me, but, you know, in these cases, but in my earlier years, um, I used to just jump from relationship to relationship really. And, one woman was never enough. And I finally reached the point that I said, you know what, I need to understand what's going on here, what the problem. Mm-hmm. And that's when I did my own therapy and I found out, oh, guess what? I have an attachment disorder mm-hmm. uh, and an avoidant attachment disorder. Mm-hmm. So therefore, I never let anyone completely in. And I had one foot in and one foot out of every relationship because of the fear 
that, oh, someone was going to leave me. Mm-hmm. So therefore, I left them first. Right. Um, I'm, I'm just so sorry to find that, to, that it took so long to figure it out because of the pain that I caused for so many other people mm-hmm. along the way. But that, that led me to, as I, you know, got into counseling, um, to want to work with men who have many of the same struggles I had. Mm-hmm. And really, actually, when I did start, I started out as a generalist, mm-hmm. but I saw these guys starting to pop into my office at a very high rate. Mm-hmm. And that's when I said, oh, you know what? I just feel like this is a calling for me. And that's the way I went. Thank you so much for, for sharing that piece. And what I also heard is that the avoidant attachment was something that you identified and that really was like a, a light bulb for you. And some people that are listening may know about avoidant attachment. Some people may not. So can you share maybe from your perspective what that really means? Yes. Yeah. An attachment disorder is something that occurs when the bonding process between a child and caregiver goes astray. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are several. I I come from the old school of the four of ambivalent, avoidant, um, dissociative and the secure or disorganized. I'm sorry. Right. And secure. Right. Right. Um, there, there have been many numerous names that have been given to them yes. along the way. An avoidant attachment, though, basically is a fear that if you allow somebody to get too close to you, that they ultimately will reject you mm-hmm. for one of two reasons. One, if I allow you very close, that means I give you the power to be able to hurt me mm-hmm. by leaving. Mm-hmm. Or if I let you in too close, you'll see how ugly I am inside. So therefore, we put up a wall and we say, hey, you know what? I can love you. I can love you really well, but just stay on this side of the wall. Do not come over here. You know, no one comes in here. Right. Um, When we learn, and as I learned along the way, is that I can adjust this wall. So therefore, I can learn to bring it in, which is what happened with my current wife now, Mm. and to allow her to get as close to me as anyone's ever gotten to me in my entire life. That wall's not coming down. Mm-hmm. And every once in a while, I may go and try to push that wall out a little bit mm-hmm. because of the, whatever fear is going on. Yeah. And then she'll very gently remind me, hey, I'm feeling a little, you know, distant from you. And I have to then take it and bring it in. But basically, it's a defense mechanism. Yeah, yeah. I also use the term survival strategy. And uh-huh. and I, I, I appreciate what you're sharing because I think most of us come from various attachment styles and part of the healing process, of course, is how do we develop trust and intimacy over time. So, yes. so it sounds like it's been quite a journey for you as it has been for me as well. So mm-hmm. thank you for that. So, Well, see, and that's, the, that's the good thing that we have, though, is that we have this history yes to be able to turn around and to show men that hey guess what you know what there is hope there's hope that you can overcome you can change and that you can live a life that you that you feel proud of you develop a sense of integrity Mm -hmm. and in your world so right integrity beautiful word Mm -hmm. so i understand that the process that you've developed is called the inner child recovery process or or icrp for short and i'm wondering if you can share with our listeners a little bit more about what that is and how you conceptualize that Mm -hmm. yeah basically my belief is the road to recovery from a porn or sex addiction goes through our childhood because i believe it is unresolved childhood pain point that are still haunting us today that we're just not aware of. We've done a wonderful job in suppressing or repressing those painful aspects of growing up that we just don't want to deal with. And But what happens is that, for example, a current event happens that what it does is reminds our inner child of something that happened in the past. And now this kid goes into this huge storage unit that he has and he pulls something out 
And he's saying this past event matches up with this current event. And what happens is our anxiety starts to increase. Our sense of discomfort starts to rise. The kid wants one thing. He wants to forget about this pain point. He's very upset that he had to reach in there and pull it out. The, the way he learned his own survival tactic was, you know what? I'm not going to think about this. Distraction. I need a distraction. Because he has one goal in mind, and that is comfort. That's all he wants is comfort. And he has trained us over the years as we stumbled across sex that, oh, is that not the mother of all distractions? And therefore, that's where he gets us to run. So we now are compulsively just picking up our phone or getting on our computer because there's this sense of discomfort. And then when we're done, we're like, what happened? Why in the world did I even go there? So the whole process is about one, um, educating people about the inner child mm -hmm. and how he operates. And I say he, although I know there's she, I know there women also have uh, sexual addiction, but I work exclusively with men, mm. so please forgive my pronoun. Uh, but there, the idea that, you know, one, educate them about the child, what the child's capable of doing. And then two, we have to understand what are those core emotional triggers that activate the child. Mm. And in the process, what I've done is I have identified nine different kids. And each of those kids have their own unique, different core emotional triggers. Mm -hmm. So once a client identifies what those triggers are, and they can have anywhere from five to 15, and we'll take them, we'll condense them down. They did not need to memorize those. I mean, I want them to know that like they know the spelling of their last mm -hmm. name. They can say it with anything. Because by being aware of what your emotional triggers are, now you can stay one step ahead of the addiction. Hmm. So nine inner children. Nine inner children. That's a lot of kids running around. There's a lot. <laughs> and I've actually had people ask me, are there more? And I said, I don't <laughs> think so, but uh, I never say never. So <laughs> We'll see. Maybe they'll multiply. You never know. But <laughs> but would it be possible, Eddie, for you to specify the nine children? Yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll, why don't I, I'll walk briefly through each of them with you. So um, one is the bored child. Now, this is a kid who was raised in an environment that offered very little in the way of positive interaction among family members. And so they're even if they're surrounded by people, um, they may have felt very isolated and alone and alone. So they learn to entertain themselves and they actually find it more comfortable to be alone than to be with others. But what happens somewhere along the line, they stumble across sex and then they find that this is a level of excitement and stimulation that they've never felt before. So whenever they start to get bored now as adults, this is the go-to to try to correct that. Mm -hmm. Um, there's the unaffirmed child. The unaffirmed child grew up receiving very little in the way of praise or perhaps a lot of criticism mm. and perhaps maybe even both uh -huh. in that. So what the result of that, that means they suffer from this low sense of self-worth mm -hmm. and their quest is to seek affirmation, to be desired. So therefore, if someone start to make eye contact with them or flirt with them. They are drawn like a moth to a flame. Also, it is very interesting, and I'm sure you've heard men say this also, mm. that when they're watching pornography, some men actually get a sense of affirmation from the women that are, that are on the other side of the camera mm -hmm. that you know that woman's looking at them and only them and wants them and desires them and that's part of the fantasy right eddie it's exactly right yeah. and that's all it is it's all the fantasy it's like the same thing when a man pays uh an escort 
And the mm-hmm. fantasy is, oh, she only wants me. She only desired me, forgetting that you just put $200 on the nightstand. Right. That doesn't matter because that, that blows the fantasy. Yeah. The third child is the unnoticed child. Now, these are the individuals who never felt they really belonged. Um, they always had to chase people. They had to chase the friends, even chase family members. And now, now today, they still have that craving for belonging. Uh, and although they want people to chase them, it doesn't happen. So therefore, their desire for attention is so strong that even if they're getting that attention from a spouse, or a partner, it may not be enough because the kid is so worried that, hey, you know what? This probably isn't going to last. It give you, I'll give you a quick example. Mm-hmm. One, uh, several clients have said to me that they remember when they were younger and they'd be playing with a friend and then another friend would come in. And before you knew it, the two of them were leaving and the person was left alone again. So the message is, oh, okay, you know what? Again, the people who say they're going to like you mm. will abandon you. Mm-hmm. So the kid is worried that whatever attention he may be getting from a spouse or partner is not going to last. Mm-hmm. And so therefore, I have to seek more. This plays in very much with what I was saying with, with my attachment disorder. Mm-hmm. Sure. One foot in, one foot out mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. The uh, fourth child is the emotionally voided child. This is the number one choice among men. And by the way, most men, when they go through this and look at these, they select anywhere from three to five Mm -hmm. kids. Uh Um, And it's not so much the kids that they pick that's really important. What's important are those core emotional triggers Mm. that are associated with each of the kids. So the emotionally voided child, which Again, I believe in my practice, I know I see nine out of 10 men who come in have a low emotional IQ. These, these folks, they don't know how to connect. They don't know how to bond. They're in their own head a lot. Mm-hmm. Okay. They're, they're, they're very distracted by things. Mm-hmm. Um, they confuse physical intimacy with emotional intimacy. Mm-hmm. I will show you how much I love you by the way I touch you, the mm-hmm. way, way I, I, the way we feel, the way we have sex. Mm-hmm. That's the way I do it. Um, but they really, what they crave is emotional intimacy. They just don't know it. Mm-hmm. They don't realize that's what they really want. Mm-hmm. They didn't, it never had it. Yeah. As I tell, as I tell my guys, I go, you wouldn't know emotional intimacy if it hit you in the face. Okay. But <laughs> that's what it is. So. Um, should I keep running along or do you have any please, questions no, along the way? Please keep going. We're good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, the need for control child. Uh, these folks grew up in a very hectic environment, very chaotic kind of environment. And so now they're, they're kid. They wanted to seek control. Mm-hmm. Why? Because by having control, okay, that means that I don't have to worry about things getting out of order again. Chaos. Growing up, they didn't have the power. You know, they didn't have any control and bad things were happening around them. Mm -hmm. So therefore, now the worldview is if I have control, no good, no bad things will happen. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's erroneous. That's not what's going to happen. Sure. But what happens in this case with these adults now is when something happens, an event occurs where they don't have control. Mm -hmm. They then run to sex as a distraction for that. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, the next child is the entitled child. The entitled child is not what most people think. And I actually really kind of wish I had renamed him to tell you the truth. Mm. Um, he's not entitled in the fact that he feels like I deserve everything. What he's entitled about is the fact that if you cross me, if you do me wrong, like, for example, if you, um, if you, if I'm unjustly accused, mm-hmm. then I deserve to go do something to make myself feel better. Uh-huh. That's what it comes down to. These individuals, they felt very devalued uh-huh. as teenagers and as kids. Maybe they lacked a, uh, they lacked voice. Um, right. Maybe it felt their needs, their desires didn't matter. So as they get older, what they do is they turn to sex as a reward for themselves. Mm. Again, the worldview here is I deserve this. Right. So when things don't go their way, then this causes them to act out. Huh. 
this this is the most dangerous of all these kids uh-huh, uh-huh. because again all he needs to do is feel that oh you have disrespected me uh-huh. and he's not processing through yeah. to be able to see the other person pain instead he's just running off to soothe his own pain yeah the weak slash inferior child uh these individuals as kids they were conditioned to believe that they were weak or inferior, uh, whether that be by their parent, their sibling, mm-hmm. their peer. Mm-hmm. So therefore, they use sex <clears throat> to feel empowered or they use sex to reinforce the sense of inferiority that they have. Uh-huh. So therefore, they may focus on fantasies that fall in line with dominance or submission. And the worldview is... I deserve to be used or I must use others. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, two more kids left. Yeah. The, the stressed child, which is the number two kid mm. behind the emotionally voided child. Uh-huh. Um, these, these individuals as children grew up in a very anxious environment, mm. feeling anxious. Yes. Um, it may have been neglect. It may have been abuse. It could be trauma, whatever. But what happens is, as you well know, Kids don't really feel comfortable living with anxiety. So therefore, they do a really wonderful job of distracting themselves Mm -hmm. from it. And you get to a point where you almost become desensitized. It's like you don't realize how bad the anxiety is that you have. And in fact, sometimes like, you know, I, I joke with clients, I go, you know, if somebody could jump in your body, they'd be like, oh my gosh, what is wrong with this person? Right. <laughs> but they're like, cause how many people, I'm sure you've met too, you know, you talk about anxiety and they say, no, I'm not an anxious person. And they're some of the most anxious people you ever meet. Yeah. Um, so what they did, they discovered that sex is a way to soothe their anxiety yeah. and, and it serves as a distraction of the chaos in their daily lives. Right. And actually regulates the nervous system. It does. It actually does serve as a soothing source. Yeah. And that, see, and that, that's the issue here. Exactly. Because they're, you know, because you got something that works for that, uh, but they have to find more healthier ways yeah. of dealing with the nervous well, system well, it's, when it's out of whack. Right. And, and of course, that short term relief is not about longer term healing. No, not at all. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And then our last child, uh-huh. left child is the early sexually stimulated or and abused child. Yes. Now, again, these individuals at a very young age, uh, stumbled across sex. I mean, uh, pornography or perhaps actually heard or saw people engaging in sex uh-huh. or they were sexually molested at an early age Mm -hmm. in many cases um what they're going to do is have irrational beliefs about sex Mm -hmm. and about themselves that sex may be dirty sex may be bad or they're dirty they're bad Mm -hmm. um and a lot of times they may use sex to punish themselves or even to hurt others um they they could be engaged in a lot of destructive types of fantasies where again they are being punished or again, they are taking it out on someone else. Mm-hmm. So this is the most tragic of all the kids that we see. Right. Wow. So Eddie, obviously you've put a lot of time and energy into developing the model. And I love the idea of the nine kids. I have this image of these kids running around kind of not knowing how to deal with life, but but you're kind of uh, corralling all of them and saying, "Here we go. We can do it. We can. We can move through this." And no, so I love the 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 whole idea. Um, once clients get a sense of the model, once they understand conceptually what the the inner child recovery process is about, how how do they actually manage their addiction and 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 move towards deeper healing? There are six steps to the process. Uh, the first step is the fact that we understand what are those triggers that we have. Uh, and once they have those, <clears throat> then what they're going to be doing is they're going to say, okay, now I need mindfulness. I need to learn to be mindful so I can be aware of a negative event that happens that I believe, ooh, you know what? This could activate my inner child. 
So now let me think about them. Let me hold on to this negative event. What does that pain, now we're in step three, what does that pain look like? Mm -hmm. What's going on here? You know, these guys don't, they don't want to sit with emotional pain. Mm -hmm. And if we look at almost any addiction, mm -hmm. right? That, that's one of the factors here. Mm -hmm. People are not sitting with pain. Mm -hmm. They're looking for a way to distract themselves. Mm -hmm. So they learn how to sit with the pain. They learn how to address the kid. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's going on with you? You know, why are you so bent out of shape about this event that happened? Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be that big a deal to me. <clears throat> but through that, now they're learning, okay, that's, this is the hurt I suffered. Okay. Now by holding on to this, I don't have to either withdraw or try to be aggressive with people. Mm -hmm. I don't need to learn to distract. I can just sit here, feel this. And while it stings, it's not going to kill me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. after that then what we're going to be doing is saying okay i'm looking at this pain and i see from an adolescent mind what he feels mm -hmm. so can i give you a quick example of Absolutely. something that would happen please okay so so let's say um you have a really good friend and you guys had a falling out and so now you're um you're not talking to each other but one day you run across each other in the street and you stop, say hello, start chatting. And then you say, you know what? Maybe we should maybe talk this out. So you arrange to have lunch. Well, the day that you're not going to have lunch, about 20 minutes before you're about to leave, he calls and says, hey, look, sorry, got to cancel. Something came up. I'll get back to you and just hangs up. Mm -hmm. Real abrupt. Mm -hmm. And you're like, all right, well, that's disappointing. I, you know, you maybe even wonder, wow, well, I wonder if he's just blowing me off again. Right. I don't know. But, okay, but your kid, recognizing this, says, oh, that reminds me of this that's in the storage unit. Mm -hmm. And he pulls out this memory of the time when you were 11 years old, and you went down the street to go see your friend Bobby. And you knock on Bobby's door, and Bobby opens up the door, and you see Bobby with three of your other friends in there. And they're like, hey, guys, what are you doing? What's going on? And he goes, oh, we're just hanging out. Oh, okay. Can I come? Can I come in? Mm -hmm. No, my mom says I can't have anybody else. And he slammed the door in your face. Mm -hmm. And now you walking home, you feel humiliated, feeling shameful. You're wondering why you're not fitting in there. You got tears running down your face. Mm -hmm. The kid is equating that phone call mm -hmm. with that kind of pain. Yeah. And perhaps you don't even know that what he's doing right now, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden your intensity level. The fact that you are bothered is increasing more and more and more to the point where it's like, you know what? I need some sort of comfort. Oh, let me go grab this. Mm -hmm. Let me go do that. And, you know, Andrew, the other thing about this is you could change, you could take out sex addiction mm -hmm. and you could put in food addiction. You know, you could put in alcohol addiction, drug addiction. This whole process works for all of those sure. along that way. So, we have to sit here and I have to sit and now the, this is what the kid thinks. All right. This is adolescent thinking. Mm -hmm. He feels that, you know what? We have been totally dismissed. We've been blown off. We've been humiliated. But I have to go to wise mind. Mm -hmm. I have to go to the adult. I have to say, whoa, wait a second, kid. Let me evaluate this. Mm -hmm. You know what? Maybe, yeah, he, he was really abrupt, but I don't know. Maybe he really was in a rush. Maybe he didn't really have a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So you know what? Why don't I give him a couple of days and see if he, if he called back? If he doesn't, I'll reach out to him. If he makes another excuse, then I'll just bring it up and say, Hey, so tell me, are you having other thoughts about this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now I've laid out the plan which is now the last step, and that is, okay, here are the healthy things I can do because mm -hmm. now I feel better about the situation, mm -hmm. and I also have these different lifelines I have um, have decided I want to use when I feel like I'm in that. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's go for a run. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's go call one of my accountability partners, whatever it is, but see, mm -hmm. I've slowed everything down. I just slowed everything down. Yeah. And by doing that, now I'm allowed, I'm able to stay one step ahead of the addiction. 
Mm. So what I really appreciate about what you're saying is that there's this inner dialogue between the present and the past. And someone recently told me, and I don't know why I've never heard this before, Eddie, but they said that trauma is often the difficulty distinguishing between the there and then and the here and now. And, and I really hear that in what you're saying, that, that if a kid is abandoned or bullied or sexually abused, that that gets stored and the current issue, the current, let's say it's um, some type of addictive compulsive process, automatically is, is really about going back and finding ways of really finding more effective ways to cope, of course, but, but, but regulating the system and, and feeling more prepared to use contrary actions to, to, to healthy, healthier choices, basically. Yeah. That's why mindfulness is so important yes. in this process. To, you know, clients need to learn to be very vigilant and aware, and not just about those emotional triggers, but there's a second component, and that is the idea of being drained. Now, we all heard of HALT, okay? Mm. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Right. But to me, that was too limiting. So therefore, what I did was I put together emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually. They're bigger buckets. Yeah. But there's lots of things that can go in that bucket that drain you. Well, when we're right. drained, bad things happen. Yeah. Because why? Because the brain is screaming for stimulation. I am so right. dry. I'm so depleted. I need something. Right. And so therefore, ooh, sex is a great way to replenish you. So they not to, they not only do they need to be mindful of those triggers, they also need to be mindful if they're being drained in one of those four areas. Right. Because and then they have to again have those lifelines. If yeah. I am drained, what am I doing to replenish myself? Right. So what they're taught is three or four times a day, they're just gonna take two minutes to say yeah. How am I doing? How am I doing, uh, you know, mentally? Um, am I focused? Uh, do I have a lot of racing thoughts going on? Are there fantasies popping in and out? What's happened? How am I doing emotionally? Have my mood shifted from this morning? Mm. How did I feel then? Now, physically, and physically is one of the strangest ones, because if we really take a moment to sit and be still and think about our physical body, it'll be like, oh, man, I feel a tightness here in my chest. Right. I feel this knot back here. I may have a low-grade headache that I wasn't even aware of before. Exactly. But let that continue to play itself out in the background. It's like a bunch mm -hmm. of background noise. And right. it, it can continue to build up. And then, whoa, what if, it, what if an emotional trigger then comes? See, right. then your risk of, of acting out continues to increase. So sure. therefore, if I know I'm drained, because we all get drained, what happens is the yellow flag come out. Caution. Right. Okay. Be cautious. This is a time I have to be a little bit, you know, on guard. For sure. So I, I need to wind down, but I wanted to just say that I, I love what you just said, especially in the context of the pandemic, because we're all feeling depleted in one way or another. But it's not really the depletion that counts. It's how we emotionally nourish ourselves. And, and so I thank you for that reminder that it's not just about addiction, although, of course, there's more, in some ways more of a danger zone uh, for those um, dealing with addiction. But, but it's the, this bigger issue of how do we know when we're depleted, really know, and how do we nourish ourselves? And, and I think that's a really fantastic place for us to to end today. Did you have anything else you wanted to share before we stop? I just want to comment on what you just said, though. That, that perfect. Structure, self-care. Yeah. We have to have those two pillars there all the time. If you don't have those two pillars and you're not continuing to strengthen them, again, your risk of acting out increases. I, I really appreciate your process around the inner child recovery because it's something that is so valuable to so many people. And, and I appreciate you spending the time today. This is a wonderful way for us to meet and get to know each other a little bit. Yes, and I, I do too. I know we've chatted you know, through emails and things in the past, but yeah, I, I appreciate you having me on. It's been uh, enjoyable for me.
Good. Well, thank you so much for your time, Eddie, and we'll be in touch. All right. All right. Goodbye. Take good care. Thank you for listening today. It was so great sharing the time with my colleague, Eddie Caparucci, and discussing this really significant topic that affects so many people dealing with out-of-control sexual behavior. Eddie can be reached at edcappa at gmail.com. That's edcappa at gmail.com. Or at his website, www.innerchild-sexaddiction.com. And please be sure to give us a five-star rating on iTunes or share our podcast on Spotify. And if there are any topics you would like us to discuss in the future, please just let us know. I look forward to you joining us on future podcasts, and thanks again for being with us today.